a little before and extended beyond 1884. And it dealt with a particular incident in African history and in European history that uh, forgotten. And it dealt with an aspect of slavery that's misunderstood. It's misunderstood because too many people are anxious to say when they're trying to excuse European slavery, the Africans were in the slave trade too. Okay, yes, yes, yes. They were. But there's such a distinct difference between the Africans, what the Africans did and what the Europeans did, that you're not talking about the same thing. Now, the Africans were not actually in the slave trade as such. But there was a, an African system of servitude that had nothing to do with the European system of slavery and had nothing in resemblance to European feudalism that was a form of European slavery. On this point, you have to be very clear because the European is forever trying to equate what he did with what someone else did. He's trying to forever wash his hands of the mess he created in the world by saying someone else did it too. All right. The Atlantic slave trade endorsed by the European church was something distinct in the history of the world, the like of which has never occurred before in the history of the world. And this was the most vicious holocaust in human history, and it deserves to be called a holocaust. And it transcends everything that man has ever thought of that is called a holocaust. And you start counting at 60 million, not six. Now, I am going to talk about an exception that needs to be brought up, and there's some other exceptions. I'm going to talk about an African figure named Jaja, who was a slave twice in one lifetime, and who became a king twice in one lifetime in Africa. And when you can show me one European case similar to that of Jaja, I'm willing to concede that there is an equation or a parallel between European slavery and African servitude. And you have to show me one European case similar to the case of Jaja. All right. First place, let's look at Nigeria. Nigeria and the problem Nigeria is having today is the fact that Nigeria was not a nation. And there's a difficulty today in making it jail as a nation because Nigeria culturally may not have intended to be a nation. Functioning separately it functioned well, quite well. The British slapped it together as one nation because they wanted it to be that way because they wanted to administer it that way. All right, when you look at the vast era that became Nigeria, let's look at what was this vast area. The northern area was an area some people came partly from the north called Hausas. And they called it Hausaland. They were basically Muslims 
partly verbal types. Now the verbal is a mystery in Africa because a lot of people like to think the verbal is white. And the verbal, like a whole lot of these people, can be white on Thursday and black on Tuesday, depending on when money is to be divided. When the budget, if the budget is to be divided on Tuesday, he's black. If black's got the budget, he's where the money is divided. All right, now, uh, the Bibles came from Northern Africa. The Bibles were in North Africa before the Arabs. They came from Western Asia. And when the Arabs came into Africa, they opposed the Arabs. Then finally, they accepted Islam and to some extent joined the Arabs. They still speak a distinct language different from the Arabs, which is called Berber. Now, Berber is not their name. The word Berber came from the Romans because when the Romans who encountered them and the Romans encountered them, the Romans were there before the Arabs got there. And the Romans asked them, who are you? What kind of people are you? Where you came from? They moved away from the Romans out in other words, drop dead, go to hell. Oh, <laughs> <the damn it. laughs> and so the Romans gave them the name Berbers. <laughs> and the name stuck. And they made the mistake that people made by accepting the name that the oppressor put from them. It's like we made the mistake accepting the stupid word Negro. When you accept the stupid word that the oppressor puts on you, become the stupid word that the oppressor puts on you. So, now, these Berbers mixed with blacks. Who was the original name? Huh? Who was the original name? Well, it got lost in the shuffle. And uh, I know a Berber scholar, uh, Edward Louise. He said, who in the hell knows? And who in the hell cares now at this late date? He says, I'm a bird, but I don't, I don't exactly know. He's, one, he's from Morocco. He's one of the finest Berber scholars, finest living Berber scholar. He's the only one that I know well enough to curse out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's written an excellent book on the Berbers, on the, on the, on the area of the Berbers. He's also written a book called The, the Crisis of the Arab Intellect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Crisis of the Arab Intellect, which is far better in its insight than Harold Cruz's Crisis of the Negro Intellect, which was about the crisis of Harold Cruz, but we don't have time <laughs> to talk about Harold Cruz's personal crisis. You know? <laughs> Write the whole chapter and died in West Indies because he had a West Indian girlfriend who quit him after three years. <laughs> and when I heard her side of the story, I agreed. <laughs> I don't know why she, why she stood it, why she stayed three years. <laughs> <laughs> so, how how has got a problem. <laughs> He hated Lorraine Hansberry because he hated Lorraine Hansberry. He wouldn't give one of his scripts to Duke Ellington, a musical. He wanted Duke Ellington to set music to one of his scripts and give it to Lorraine Hansberry to give to Duke Ellington. And she wouldn't do it because I'm glad he didn't know that I knew Duke Ellington better than Lorraine Hansberry. He would have given me the script. <laughs> And Duke would have told me to go to hell. <laughs> and rightly so. 
<laughs> well, hell, hell wrote a book about his personal crisis. A man got a right to write a book about his personal crisis, but let him call it that. <laughs> men, men write good books about their personal crisis. Sigmund Freud made a whole profession out of his. <laughs> An international profession out of his personal crisis. So ain't, ain't nothing wrong with it. Ain't nothing basically wrong with it. But he admitted it. He was honest about it. <laughs> All right, now, what I'm trying to get to, trying to shape that, the, how Nigeria came into being. Another group called the Fulani, settled in the north, and cooperated, they were Muslim too, and they were mixed with uh, little Berber, little African, and also mixed with a, a, a bunch of troublemakers out in the desert, the, uh, the uh, uh, Turex, still troublemakers, still out in the desert. They're um, blue men, they, they wear veils, they wear the veils. They are, they are desert gangsters, raiding towns out there. And, and there's, there's a good literature on the, on the uh, Turex. Surrender Rod wrote a book on, on them called The People of the Veil. And, uh, they're despicable now, they breed a very beautiful woman. The women are very beautiful and they're so despicable, they bring them to the coast. They're nothing but a bunch of camps now. Bring the women to service prostitutes in the houses along the coast. Got no, no honor among them to rest. He used to kill you for looking at him, not in southern Sometimes there's a, diff there's a difficulty traveling so much and knowing so much and knowing so many different people under so many disguises and looking at so many people's closets. But they're just culture. I mean, I mean what? The Fulani partner was with the Turex. That was when the Turex were warriors and not pimps. So the Turex were magnificent warriors. Always warred on the wrong people for the wrong reasons. Always wrecked the wrong to wreck cities, never learned how to build one. <laughs> we got it as it at least. The Fulanis were mixed with the Turex. Uh, now, now, now you have North Africa, North, Northern Nigeria. Different culture. Mostly Muslim culture, Northern Nigeria. All right, Eastern Nigeria, Igbo people. Your basic organized group were Eastern, were Igbo people. Although the Igbo people were not a minority, were not a majority, they were the best organized group. They organized themselves and shouted so loud they thought they were the majority but they were not. When all these other groups came together, that, uh, the other groups were the majority, but the other groups didn't come together. You had other groups in the East, uh, consisting of half a million here, 200,000 there, 100,000 there. But the Igbo and his two million were together. And the joke in Nigeria, or the joke anyway, Wherever you see two Igbos together alone, that is a fight. Igbos are forever fighting on Igbos, among Igbos. But wherever you see two Igbos in the presence of a non Igbo, that is an Igbo protection society. Because the minute the non Igbo appears, they unite against the non Igbo. <laughs> They will unite when the every non evo is, is is the enemy. They're very clannish. Obnoxiously so. <laughs> now, in the West, you have a different kind of people. You have the Yoruba. 
a large group of people, a beautiful home homogeneous culture, and a people who unfortunately were trapped and caught the worst of the West African slave trade because of millions of evils came to the West as slaves. And this is reflected in the slave revolts in the West. In the West, you will find in the slave revolts nearly always solidified and instigated by evil, nearly always led by a cannabis. The Igbos from Nigeria set it in motion, then stepped aside and let the Akans from Ghana lead it. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. There's the Maroon Revolt in Jamaica was <coughs> set in motion by Igbos, Captain Kojo. That's a Ghanaian man, led the revolt. The Bubby's revolt in Guyana set in motion by the Ankara and Ebo, Captain Kofi, Ko a Ghanaian again, I can, led the revolt. To St. Louverture was a can. Bookman, who really is the real hero of the first Haitian revolt was evil. When you look at this culture breakdown, the leadership of the major revolts in the West Indies was a can from God. The instigator was General Evil. They formed a partnership and a corporation away from whom the lack of which they never had at home before or since. They don't cooperate this way in Africa right now and never did in Africa and never, and never, and never even thought about doing it in Africa. When Nkrumah, who was a Nakan, came to power in Ghana, the greatest jealousy of Nkrumah came from the Igbos of Nigeria. I'm going to show you that while in the Western world, away from Africa, they formed a partnership. All right, now, now that you have this big country, the British occupied part of it, and they called House Land, Evil Land, and Yoruba Land. And it was governed as separate pieces. Then the British, who had grown tired of sending their young men to die in these colonial wars, the British public had grown sick of this. So now the British were pressed to explain why you are still taking over another territory. Under the then governor of the area, the British governor, a man named Lugar, he was a captain then. Later on, he's become Lord, which is going to become later. Now, this is an aside, but something which I can't explain. When you look at Lord Lugar, he's a little weasel with a long one for the beard. When you look at the lady, Luga, uh, who's going to become Lady Luga, she's a lush and plush British lady, very posy and, you know, striking. And what she saw in the little music, I don't know, but these women have their secrets and what they look for in a man, and I guess it will forever remain a secret. <laughs> but, <laughs> It seems she liked what she saw, and he liked what he saw. 
But in the course of writing the article, she fell in love with him and vice versa, and he got married. And now, after he unified the area, and she and the British rewarded him with knighthood, meaning Sir Lugar, because he had said, well, in East Africa and written on him, to while you work on it, our East African Empire, and later rewarded him further by making him a lord. So she's Lady Luca. And he couldn't stand the African climate all year round, so he spent six months in Nigeria and six months in England. So she's got a lot of time on her hand. Tyler ladies do not hold jobs. And she wanted to do something with the time. So she decided to write a, a book. It's permissible for Tyler ladies to write books. <laughs> now this is the age of Charlotte Bronte and that crowd. Cool book. She writes the whole history of Crimea, Crimea and she writes the whole book of and don't even mention it, the Crimean War. And her book is later the period. How she managed it, I don't know. Uh, she one of the with Wuthering Heights and one of the Bronte sisters. Uh, we, that's not significant. Um, Lady Lugard decided to write a book, and she's going to write a book defending the British takeover of Nigeria. But she decided she would write a preface explaining what happened in this part of Africa, in inner West Africa, before the British take over, before the Europeans came. And she did her research well. She did so much research for a preface, and so much writing for a preface, the preface became the book. The preface was so good, the preface became the book. In the last part of the book, she spent about 100 pages defending the British takeover, but people stopped reading by that point. The book is called A Tropical Dependency. Africa didn't need the Europeans at all. Because she did an analysis of these great independent states in Africa before the European came, including the last great African nation state, Songhai, and its leaders, and its greatest, greatest leader, Muhammad it to be known as Askia the Great. Barnes and Noble didn't read their book. I bought an edition in Peekskill and reasonably priced. Then I looked and saw another new edition coming out. It said so many guineas, and because I didn't know guineas from pounds. You, you forget about that last part of it. But she did some very good, clear writing. And she also did some good preface work on the Southern African origins of Egypt and putting it in order. It was from, with her suggestion, that the country got the name Nigeria from the Niger River. Well, now this is Nigeria. This is how it came to be. The person I'm going to talk about is from Eastern Nigeria, and he is Igbo. What the British tried to do is to break the trade relationships. Now, when the British arrived in Nigeria, even during the British slave trading, they found that Africans controlled vast trading areas, stores, and Africans had networks of trading posts stretching 
all the way down the coast. And the British tried to use these networks in the slave trade. And when these Africans failed to let the British do this, they brought in Lebanese types and drove some of these Africans out of the legitimate trade. See, never let it be said that the Africans could not deal with commerce, even surplus, and because they were dealing in commerce with each other, dealing with peppers, dealing with iron too. There was nothing the African needed that African wasn't supplying other Africans. See, I repeatedly said the slave trade hit Africa during its pre-industrial period. And had Africa been left alone, Africans could have entered the industrial period along with other nations. And many African states were more advanced than some European states. But had they left the law to move into the industrial age and had better technicians and had more than the embryo of technology when the slave trade came. As emphasized by the number of African iron workers who was called the slave trade, Number of African craftsmen, leather tanners. These, these people came to the United States and practiced their trade in the United States. The iron workers were noted for the grill work in New Orleans and in, in, in the like. Because the French, when they had New Orleans, they let the African craftsman work, use his craft. A lot of the decorative work on the old French mansions. And the, the, the porches were decorative with African iron work. Now these things are not museums. They were beautiful enough. When the French changed the, the architectural structure in New Orleans, a lot of that work that was designed by Africans were taken down and preserved. Some of it was destroyed, but some of it was, reserved, was preserved. Now, Eastern Nigeria, was a trading city center. There was a night, part of a Niger River comes through eastern Nigeria. And there was a trading city. Now the city of Hakor, uh, Port Hakor, was then the city of Bona. And at this city was a contest between two trading families, Manapipo and Anapipo and two kings of these trading families. One king, Anapipo, had an unruly slave named Jaja. And so this king wanted to literally play a trick on the other king. So he gave him this slave Jaja because he was unruly, hoping that this unruly slave would drive him out of his mind. <laughs> Jaja went into this house instead of driving the king out of his mind because he was treated decently. He calmed down and acted as though he was one of his sons. He learned the palm oil business. He learned accounting. And he grew up in that house as though he was one of the sons and was treated as such. And at 19, he was handling accounts equivalent to $50,000 a year and handling them well giving an account to the king. So now, when the king died, the sons who preferred to stay in the palm oil business because being a king wasn't as profitable as dealing in palm oil, said, well, father loved him. He was 
told the father that we were, let him be king. <laughs> in other words, who wants to be king? You know, money in the job anyway. <laughs> it's okay, all right, let him be king if he wants to be king. <laughs> so they let him be king. They made him king of the house of Antipas, fearing that the stigma of having once been a slave would follow him, and also fearing his mortal enemy, the son of the local king, who was always kidding him, always reminding him of his lowly status, fearing to be aggravated by this. He began to send agents up the Niger to the palm oil markets. The river goes in proms. He, so he sent them to the terminus of that river where the palm oil is collected to make peace with all the kings at the terminus of the river because that's the heart of the palm oil business. He says, one day I'm going to come up there and I might establish my headquarters up there and I want to know whether I have your goodwill when I get there. All the kings told him, well, you will have our goodwill. If we have yours, you will have ours. So one day he burned part of his village, fled upriver and established a kingdom in honor of the king, the late king, that had treated him decently. He called it Oprabo. And he is known as Jaja of Oprabo. There he built a kingdom. He blocked the British inland move to take over the palm oil business. So you couldn't get nothing out of that area unless you dealt with that terminus. Because everything came out of the prom of that river. He had captured the terminus where the rivers began to prom off in different directions. And all the people had his goodwill. He said, the British get nothing. No, no prom oil comes out of here. So they had united. The British called a strike. And so now he had bankrupt the British palm oil business. And some of the British sailors came up there to work for him. And the British were in a terrible way. For well, he had not only wrecked that palm oil business, he wrecked that legitimate trade. Or well, he was the master of the river. And when we look at his records, the records were well kept by a black American woman from Liberia. What happened to her ultimately, I don't know. But the records were found by an Australian woman married to a Nigerian. Her name was Elizabeth Nchaya. She's still alive and still in Nigeria. But what happened to Emma Goldman, no one knows. But when she was keeping the records, they were meticulously kept, her handwriting. There was a point where someone else was keeping the records. All right. Um, Jaja was a good businessman. And finally, the British in a quandary turned to Sir Harry Johnson. And Sir Harry Johnson told him, you, you, you uh, use the guns too much. Told them, we've got to use diplomacy. So they sent a ship up there and told Jaja a lot. We will not. Um, do you any harm, come aboard the ship and we will talk, treat it with you. And he came aboard the ship and they talked. And he looked up and noticed the ship was moving and he was surrounded by soldiers. They lied to him and kidnapped him. And they sent him to a crowd. The British had a court in the crowd. 
and they tried and they couldn't quite understand what they were trying all about. And they sent him to Sierra Leone, tried him again, of not uh, 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 different charges. Finally, they sent him to St. Vincent in the West Indies. Then they sent him to Barbados. Fortunately, I, John Killian's father was alive up until about 10 years ago. And he was a boy growing up in Barbados. And Jaja was in Barbados, in exile. And Jaja in Barbados is a part of the folklore of Barbados. To this day, there's a song they sing about Jaja. So Jaja had a role in art. Mm -hmm. And if an ordinary man, you know, lays court and looks at your woman in a way you don't like, you can just put up your deuce and fight it out. But if a king looks at your woman, well, you kind of look more careful. So the, the song in Barbados, which Louise Bennett can sing it better than anybody, she's Jamaican. <laughs> but it, it sings, Oh, Ja Ja, what are we going to do about Oh, Ja Ja? Oh, Ja Ja, not to ting, but after all, he is a king. What are we going to do about Oh, Ja Ja? <laughs> but Ja Ja lived until about the 1890s. He kept petitioning the British to let him return to his domains. Finally, the British consented to let him return, and they poisoned him on the ship going back to Africa. And he returned to be buried at uh, Bona, now the city of Port, Port Harcourt. A Nigerian scholar, then head of the <coughs> university, had a bat in chemical decay, and also the creator of the Yoruba scheme and the Igbo scheme, historical scheme. Very good friend of mine, unfortunately dead now. We decided that we're going to put a hold on all the material about Jai Jai. The scholars can get together and do this. They got connection. Nobody is going to see all any of the material on Jai Jai for five years until we have gone over it and decided what kind of book we're going to write. After that, we'll let it go to other scholars. Yet, yeah, after we made our decision. Well, five years passed. Kenneth, Kenneth uh, got busy, I got busy. Then there was this stupid Igbo, uh, stupid Biafra war. And because uh, Kenneth O'D.K. is an Igbo, he got all involved in that. And I got involved in a whole lot of things, including getting married the second time, and uh, that's kind of an involved man. You said it. <laughs> I never got my book on Jai Jai out, he never got here, but I did do a good short piece on Jai Jai, and Kenneth D.K. wrote a book called Trade and Politics on the Night. Yeah. Jai Jai. And there's a little book called Lives of Eminent Nigerians, edited by Kenneth O.D.K. There's a chapter called On Jai Jai. And there's a little pamphlet called um, Jai Jai of Oprah Book. No shortage of work on Jai Jai. And the new histories of Nigeria have not only life of Jaja but pictures of Jaja. Now, with uh, Jaja gone, the British had uh, thought that they had won the fight to dominate the trade of the Eastern Nigeria, the Eastern Niger River. They had overestimated the Nigerian mine and the ability to trade. And the Western 
Nigel Branch. There was someone else they had to face. They had to face now an evil. His name was Nina. He was Nina of the Kitsakara Ebo. Now when you call an Ebo Kitsakara, that means the trading branch of the Ebo. He equally fought, faced the British because he was a trader and he controlled a network of traders. Now, if you understand what I'm talking about, the Europeans have tried to drive the African out of the trades. And this is why, to drive African people out of commerce. If you understand me, you understand why they assume now that farmers must take over our neighborhood. And because you have forgotten that Africans were master tradesmen engaged in commerce long before slavery, long before the first European came, and that commerce is a natural thing for Africans to engage in, and that when people want to oppress you, the first thing they do is to destroy yourself confidence and historical memory. And when you forget what you have done, you will also forget what you got to do. And so the case of Jaja and the case of Nina of the Itzikara relates to what is happening in our community right now. The case of other people taking over prerogatives, commercial prerogatives in our communities because we have forgotten the time when we were the masters, not only of the commerce of our community, but commerce in general. When it was a perfectly natural thing for us to trade with each other, not only to buy and to sell, but to manufacture what we were buying and selling to each other. This is the whole concept of nation management. Nation management is not only buying and selling, nation management is producing what you buy and sell and producing what you consume. So it all goes back, you know, what has all of this got to do with today? It has everything to do with today because all history is a current event anyway. Everything you say about yesterday in some way relate to today. So if you understand Jaja and why they had to destroy him, you will understand why they have to literally destroy the commerce of our community and why many times they, they will literally lower the rent when a farmer wants to rent a store in our community and double the rent when one of us want to rent a store in our own community because they want to keep us out of commerce they want us to forget the time when we were masters of commerce long before any European ever came to any African state. And the commerce was nothing new to us. This is why history is important because the role of history properly taught is supposed to make you remember what you once was so that you can understand what you still have to be. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. To recite dates to you, to recite personalities to you, oh, you don't need anybody to do that. You can do that for yourself. Now, I can tell you when Columbus allegedly discovered America, knowing damn well he didn't. But what good is it unless I explain the significance of it? What you need is analysis of why things happen and what you can do with the information. Otherwise, all you've got is a bunch of cluttered dates. And this is why 
Ja, the life of Jaja is a perfect example of an African who was a slave twice in one lifetime and a king twice in one lifetime. And yet, you can someone say, Africans had a system of slavery. You say, yes, of course, of course it did. Now let me give you an example of one. Let me explain the case of Jaja. Ja. <laughs> of course he was a slave. He had two African masters. He was a king too. <laughs> and a very credible one. <laughs> and a very competent one. This is why he lived and this is why he died. Show me one case of a European who lived that way from slavery twice to a king twice, killed by his opposition, who feared his ability to match them in Congress, feared his mind, his ability to be skillful in commerce, to know economics. A man who never wore a store-bought shoe or went inside of a school outmatched some of the economic minds of Europe and literally bankrupted the British Empire in their attempt to control the palm oil business of eastern Nigeria deserves at least a footnote in history. Deserves a children's book, at least. I think what we need to do is to write simplified stories of these people. At first, simplified stories that we can talk to children about. Then, let the big books with the scholars and all that jargon theories, let that come later. Explain it very simply. Tell the child, let me tell you the story about Jaja. You've been nice today. I'm going to tell you a nice little story. <laughs> story about an African who slave and became a king. I did that to my children uh, a lot. You know, tell them a little simple story. On those evenings when I was, had enough well, at home. They don't know I was home near that most nights. But they say, well, Daddy, you rarely have a home. You know, children can, well, they can tell you some of the biggest things. <laughs> they don't know your home night before that. <laughs> That's all right. But they're grown and gone now. Well, one's grown and gone, the other one's gone. Mm -hmm. My 16-year-old is still laughing. He's an A student in history. Oh, <laughs> Honors in history and speech. I don't know what that means at all. Yeah. Yes, we, 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 let's see what kind of time we got now. We have a little time. On the, uh, the trade and the destruction of trade, uh, in, in an analysis, that's why I think, and I, I agree with you, that the uh, taxi limousine service, every time you look around, these brothers are getting tickets, and even the street vendors, uh, they do everything they possibly can to uh, destroy uh, commerce, uh, private ownership mm -hmm. uh, in the black community. Self-reliance, that's what it is. It's amounts to, you yes. must, they're trying to program us into dependency. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the sum total of it. Well, see, we assume that so-called third world people have mercy for us. 
we assume that it's like we assume that racism stops at the door of communism and socialism. We assume that it stops at the door of so-called third world people. Well, it's an idealistic assumption, but unfortunately it's not true. On the Biafran War, huh? on the Biafran War, could you speak a little bit on the war between the uh, Biafrans and the Well, the, the war itself um, was a, a war manufactured by the media. The Biafra war was really a war between eastern Nigeria and western Nigeria. And they were really fighting over who would control the oil interest. And the war was engineered from outside of Nigeria. The Catholic Church and Israel and some other nations back to be off in war. And England, some others back the other side. It was really a civil war. And Nigerians settled it eventually with some kind of intelligence because the Nigerians got together and didn't engage in long drawn out revenge or punishment of those who engaged in the war. Even put evil governors in Yoruba countries, Yoruba territory, and vice versa, so that each one can get to know each other better. He would switch teachers around so that they can get to know each other better. There's still some wounds from the war. But the mistake that the Igbos made, because the Igbos, who call themselves the black Jews of Nigeria, is another mistake because it had nothing to do with the Jews at all. But they were industrial people, and they make a dollar, save a dollar. But when they engineered the coup, the first coup, kind of a cleansing coup, over to one government, killed the wrong man, killed some people in Nigeria needed, but cleared out one set of corrupt people, only to see another group come in. One of the most able people who came from the north was killed back up uh, fellow and um, Nigerians both East Igbos and the Yorubas feel ascendancy of the north who now controls Nigeria because the north is the less educated but numerically the north is the largest population in Nigeria then the Igbos made a terrible mistake in the second coup, they killed the religious leader of the Muslims, the Sadana. The Sadana Sakatu. You never kill a religious leader. If a people want a religious leader killed, let them do it. Don't you ever touch a religious, a people and religious leader. If they hate him, let them do it. They want to get rid of him, let them do it. Don't you do it. You do not have the right. They're sensitive about that. You, an outsider who don't belong to that religion, come in and killing that religious leader. See, then the Muslims turned on the Igbos and killed them wholesale. The Igbos hold, held the jobs in the north. They ran the post office in the north because those proud houses of Lannis 
who were aristocrats. They didn't do much. A house woman was the most pampered woman in, the, in all Nigeria. A house woman would go to the store, get a spool of thread, and carry it, and takes a servant to carry it back home. I know a, a girl here, Rashida Abubakar, and she kept saying, this is, this is, she's Hausa. She, 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 I, I, and I told her, you got a Hausa name, but you're not a Hausa. She was shocked. I said, you grew up in one of those. One of your parents was an Igbo. So she finally admitted her mother was a uh, Ebo, father was a house who left a mother. I said, how do you know? I said, you laugh, you laugh out loud, though pleasantly. I know house of women. A house of woman never laughs in public. And when she feels pleasantly about anything, it shows only in her eyes. She expresses ple other pleasures only in the confines of her home with her immediate family. She's a very, she's a very private woman. It's part of her culture. She's reserved and private. Nothing impresses her to the point where she will even giggle. But to watch her eyes tells you her expression. It's a closed culture. She's protected from the closed walls of her home and served. And yet that protection is a form of servitude. Touch her, you might get your hands cut off. Better not touch her. A non-house of man, they not look too hard at her. Is it still today? Today. <laughs> Very sheltered, very protected. <laughs> Society changed almost from block to block in some parts of Africa. You better know what you're doing. And I'm in northern Nigeria, I see a house of women. Any part of the sidewalk she wants, she can get it. <laughs> Step aside with respect for fear I might touch her by accident and get myself killed. <laughs> That's tr tradition. But some house of women want out. They want to go to college. Conflicts would come in with African Americans and Africans not being aware of the culture. Yeah. yeah. But now you go in uh, eastern Nigeria, western Nigeria, you will find it's quite different. And what you will find the culture more closely related to the U.S., South Africa. Yeah. The black culture, more related to the U.S. would be in South Africa. I noticed this when I was promoting the play Fellow Victorious. The humor of the play related, the South Africans who attended the play could get the nuances of that humor. The other Africans didn't, you know, the black creature humor didn't bother, didn't, didn't, they didn't understand none of it. The South Africans understood black creature humor, picked it up right away, you know. <laughs> Just a matter of the nuances, you know. But we, if we ever understood each other, we, we, we'd be well on our way.
Can we have another question? We must be pushing the time. Now next week, next uh, uh, Monday, I'm going to try to work on some of these other things. Um, also, but next Monday we we'll be talking about some of the resistance in the French area of the Hanson and Somali and others. The Hanson is noted for fighting with the all female army, um, at least as assault troops, all female army. And that's been misunderstood because a lot of uh, Feminism felt that these women were lesbians and had nothing to do with it at all. There were female armies in Africa on several occasions. Many of them had children, function. And in Angola, a lot of the uh, The, uh, there was a change of roles in Angola, one of the probably better things that happened in Angola. More, many times the men would fight and leave the front and go behind and take care of the children a while and let the wife go up on the front and shoot at the Portuguese a while. Sometimes she shot better than he. Some of Michelle's first wife was a good soldier on the line and was killed. Fighting up on the line. His first wife. And was as good as any soldier. He gave a splendid account of herself as any soldier. So.